Yes, um, I'm from the Ostrobotnia Fisheries Association, and uh, in Ostrobotnia, uh, it's on the west coast of Finland, and we have very important uh, perch fisheries here. And uh, I've been working there for five five years now, and um, and the cormorants have have spread to this uh, part. The latest they have come is this part of Finland. And uh, it has become a huge problem for our perch fisheries, and this is the reason why why I have been working in this area now for a few years. So I thank you for your invitation for me to come and speak here, and I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the Finnish situation with the cormorants, and I want to also give you some some history. So I'm going to go through the early years because it does have what was done then and the, the studies that were done then have actually uh, affected our current situation. And then uh, the management plan, we have a management plan from 2005 and it hasn't been updated since then. And then there are some guidance documents that the Environment uh, Ministry has done to guide the regional environmental uh, authorizations. Uh, and then I'm going to go through permits that have been granted and court appeals. There have been a, a lot of appeals to courts, uh, so there are, are those. And then management measures that have been taken, give, give an overview of that. And then research in the last eight years and the current situation. So we start with the 1996 was the first year when Cormorant nested in Finland. And there were 10 pairs in Rasebori, which is on the south southern coast. And uh, in 97, um, there were 24 pairs, and already then a small colony was, uh, was illegally destroyed by the local community, all the local locals in, in that area. Uh, and 98, it increased to 122, and then there was also illegal destroy, destroying of, of uh, nests. And then 2010, 699 pairs, and, uh, and then some nests, eggs uh, in one colony was destroyed. So the, the conflict started immediately, pretty much, because the, and it was the, the local fishermen, the fishermen already then had huge problems with seals, and they saw the impact of seals on their fish, fish catches. And so the cormorant came and it became an, addish, an additional problem that they didn't want to have. And uh, so the fishermen were the first to report on, on that damage on fish stocks, that they, this affects their, their catch. But at that time, there was no system in place to apply for derogation measures. So the bird directive was taken into fin the Finnish law through the, the natural protection law. But there was no system, there was no guidance to authorities on how to deal with, with this. And there, so debates uh, started quickly on the effects of cormorants. And then this, uh, may, uh, this then got the researchers involved and uh, Alexi Lehikoinen did his uh, master's degree on, on this uh, in 2003 or 2002, studied of regurgitated fish from own colonies. So he collected the regurgitated fish and uh, looked at the species. And these similar diet studies were repeated 2000 to 2009, and uh, this is a, this diagram shows a, an average of the of the results from these studies. So they looked at the scales, included in the pellets, but also on regurgitated fish. And these were these studies were focused or concentrated in the western Finnish Bay and Archipelago Sea, and uh, around colonies with 100 to 200 uh, nests. And uh, you can see 47% of those were cyprinids and 23% were eel pouch. And uh, the researchers and the common view that was said over and over again is that the cormorants only eat these uh, non-valuable uh, no, non commercial fish species. They only eat cyprinids. So it was said over and over again, and if you say something many times, it becomes a general conception. And this is still, still the idea that many people have, that they only eat these commercially invaluable species. So that's the, the, the early years. And then we go to the management plan that was uh, 
conduct May 2004. So the Minister of Environment uh, appointed a working group to make a plan. And in 2004, we had nearly 3,000 nesting pairs. And uh, the, nest, the locations of those were are found on the map there. So they have all, had already then in those years, eight years spread along the whole coastal area. But the focus is in the southern, southern areas and the archipelago sea. And uh, this working group that consisted of um, researchers from the natural the Na National Research Center and uh, universities and also the interest groups, Fishermen's Federation and, and Water Owner uh, Federation. They then noted that this level of uh, this population has uh, reached a favorable conservation status in 2004. And then they made some a lot, of, a lot of suggestions for further documentation. They didn't make, in this plan, there is no plan for how to, how to manage to decrease damage. There is, so, there is only suggestions on how to document more. We need more documentation was the conclusion in the plan. And there is a long list of, of different studies that they suggested that should be done in Finland. But uh, the Finnish Fishermen's Association that was taken was a part of this group. They then uh, made a dissenting opinion, which is in, at the back of the plan. And they, they said that we need immediately f formulate clear criteria on how to demonstrate negative impacts so that we can use the derogation measures. We need to establish a compensation scheme for fishermen to compensate for the loss of catch. We need to develop methods to prevent damage. And we also need to establish prerequisites for limiting the population. So they were saying that, for example, we need to put pressure on that the cormorant is moved to EU's list of huntable species. So this was the plan, and it is still the plan, but you cannot find this on the Environment Ministry's website. So any, anyway, you have to ask for it because in 2005, we had uh, 3,000 pairs, and today we have almost 27,000 pairs. So the situation has changed a lot from this plan. Um, then after that, what happened was that the Minister of, of Environment made a guidance document. But I need to show you the bird directive and Article 9. I know, Niels, you, you mentioned it a bit, this, but there are three three grounds for that gives you uh, the right to to do derogation measures or to allow them and uh, it's in the interest of public health and safety in the interest of air safety and then to prevent serious damage to crops livestock fisheries and water forests that that uh, third one there in the a is the most important and it's how derogation measures are used in most countries. This is the, mo the most used uh, ground for, for giving that. And then B is to for the pur purpose of research and teaching. And then C is to permit, uh, under strictly supervised conditions, the capture and keeping uh, of certain birds in a small number. And this is what our ministry uh, got stuck on these small numbers. So in the first guide, guiding document to the authorities, regional authorities that would deal with applications for derogation measures, it refers to the, to the Commission's Guide to Sustainable Hunting under the BIRDS Directive, where the small number is defined as 1% of the annual natural mortality. And in the guidance document, there is an appendix that gives you an example of how in Finland we would, or the authorities would calculate what a small number is. Uh, so 2005, they give this example. There were 4,600 nesting pairs in Finland. And so they calculate the total number of adults, which is 9,200, double the nesting pairs. And then uh, annual mortality, this is by, based on research by Alexi Lehikoinen, who actually studied this. So, well, annual mortality is 12%. So that would be 1,656 individuals. And then 1% 1 of that is then 17 individuals. 
but uh, they also included the natural mortality of the young fledglings per pair. So they calculated that, and that based also on Finnish research, 1.885 young fledglings per pair. And then the mortality is 42%, the natural mortality. And then 1% of that is 36 individuals. So small number of the Finnish population is 53 individuals that would be allowed to, to be shot through this. And they, they then link this to, to B, not the C. It's, so it's applied for all the A, B and C. So it's an incorrect interpretation of the bird directive. Then the second guide came in 2010. Then they removed the reference for, to this small number. It's not in there anymore. Uh, then we have 16,000 nesting pairs in Finland, and they have spread, and the conflict has increased further. In this guidance document, they define problem areas to aid the authorities in assessment of serious damage. And they calculate the, the number of, um, of um, nets that commercial fishermen use in different areas, and then they plot on the, on the maps and darker areas um, problematic areas. And then they look at the number of, of nests and the colonies. And if they have a lot of colonies and nests, then it's a problem area. And in these areas, they should be able to give out the derogation measures more easily. But every case is looked at specifically. So it doesn't, even, even if it's a problem area, it doesn't mean that it will automatically get you, you will at automatically get uh, to do derogation measures. And then if we look at decisions on derogation measures in this period, 2001 to 2014, six, 68 applications were done and 23 were rejected immediately because they were not in problem areas or no reported evidence to support applications. Most of these applications came after 2010. So before then, there were not very many. And then 45 were granted, but mostly for research purposes and for, ring, for ringing uh, cormorants and so on. And 13 to prevent uh, damage. And then for, on these, there were 16 appeals to courts and most led to the conclusion that reported serious damage was inadequate. So the permit should not have have been granted. But this is a long process in the courts. So once the decision of the court was published and made, there were, the grant had already, the date for the grant had already gone out. So it wasn't, it didn't have any effect. Okay, then we have a Supreme Administrative Court, and this is important even today. It came 2014. Because in one area, and it was actually a Strabotnian area, the authorities there, they gave permission to shoot 150 birds, and it was outside the problem area. And in the guidance, it says that if, if you get an application that is outside the problem area, you need to get a statement from the research centers to see if, if they can support that, yes, there is, it's likely that serious damage is happening here. But they didn't get the statement. So ornithologists, uh, ornithological associations uh, made an appeal and it actually went to the Supreme Administrative Court and they said, yes, it's true, you should not have given permission. It's wrong that you gave permission because you didn't get the statement from the research centers. So it was a process fault that it fell on. And now this is legal precedent. And so uh, our authorities now for every case, they ask for a statement from the research center and it prolongs the process a lot. And uh, in 2000, also a result of this uh, was that the decision making was centralized. So before it was regional centers and now it was centralized to Turku. And then the third guide was, uh, was uh, published in 2016 when we have 24,000 nesting pairs. And you, they removed the reference to the problem areas. Uh, and they wanted to, the working group that was appointed, they really wanted to reduce the burden for the applicants so that they would be eas easier to get, get these um, measures. 
so they put in in the guidance general information on feeding and diet of cormorants that that should be the, uh, the applicants can can refer to that in able to get to show that it's likely that serious damage is happening here and also if you if you show that fisheries catches have decreased or there is damage catched and estimates of economic loss that should be enough if it shows a, a clear decrease to get these measures. But the um, authorities are now referring to this precedent. They have to get this uh, statement from the, from the research centers. And the researchers in Finland don't have uh, so waterproof, they don't have uh, very well documents, documentation of the impact of cormorants, and especially not in every area. So they look at every case separately. So in one area, there is no studies done, or any, they, the research have no idea what's happening there. They can't put in the statement anything. They just put, uh, we don't, they can't, they don't know anything. So nothing, this means that they don't, they cannot support the applicants and they, they don't get permission. And uh, now we go to the management measure, what, what has been done in Finland with shooting. These are from the Habides uh, records that every country has to give a report to the EU on what measures have been taken. So these are the numbers here. Number of permitted uh, birds to shoot and then the number of birds shot. So how many were used? And in the last years, there have been really few. So 210 were permitted last year, but two were shot of these. And the reason for this is, is that, that in the decisions, if they give permit for shooting, they make conditions that make the shooting very difficult. So in one area where they permitted to shoot 30 uh, cormorants, in an area where there were 12,500 cormorants, they, they gave 30. And, uh, and they gave it from 20th of August, and there were no cormorants left in that area, and it was in a restricted area in the inner archipelago. So there is no way you can, you can use that permit. And in one area, one fisherman got, to, got a permission to shoot 80. Also in an area from 20th of August, there were no cormorants left then, so he, he couldn't shoot any. <clears throat> Egg prigging has been tested in 2010, and this was in cooperation with the Finnish Environment Institute. They wanted to, to test, and it was actually suggested in the management plan from 2005 that, that we should test the egg treatment. And um, the fisheries association that got this permit, they got it in three days. So from, from uh, talking with the Finnish Environment Institute, and planning, okay, we'll try it here. And then they, they gave in the application and got the decision in three days. And then they had to start it on in two days, two, two days after that. The process was very quick and they didn't have time to prepare, they told me. So they used these nails and they had to, you, they had to touch the egg and put a hole in it. And, and uh, it made a lot of, it wasn't correctly done, I think. Because a lot of a lot of the birds they they left the area. Uh, Seventy three chicks were hatched in that area where there were three hundred thirty two nests, and because they they left, many of the adults left the colony. The Finnish Institute of in my Environment they concluded that it was unsuccessful. Egg pricking is unsuccessful, so no permission for for egg pricking anymore. Was the con was the result from this test? In 2016, with the new uh, guidance, uh, scaring became, it was, was much more easy to get permits to scare colonies away. And in one area in Finland where the, the biggest colony with 4,000 nests that had been there for maybe five, six years, uh, they, they got permit, permission to scare that whole colony away. Uh, so they, they did some bur burning of nests and they had this inflatable rubber man, I don't know, uh, that inflated now and then to scare. 
and then they had this air cannon that made uh, explosive noises, and then they also drove around with boats. They had permission for all this. And the whole colony disappeared from here. So it was successful in that way, and our Minister of Environment, he, he said in the press, uh, yeah, this is very successful, scaring is very successful. Uh, so let's look at the consequences of the scaring. This, uh, with the arrow up there, that's where the colony of 4,000 pairs was. There was also scaring here in the south of Finland. These were the colonies 2015, so the scaring happened in the spring, immediately when they, they arrived. And so colonies 2016, you can see that where the arrow is there, that colony is, is not there anymore. But here, these colonies increased with about 4,000 pairs. So it only led to, obviously, it just led to spreading of them and them joining other ex existing colonies and nesting there. Egg oiling, we tested this year, 2018, in, in Vasa, in, in uh, Ostrobotnia. It's the first time it's done in Finland, and it took two years to get this permission. And the colony was the, about 1,300 nests. And it, this is in an area where uh, perch spawning, it's a, the most important perch spawning area in Finland, the most dense production of, uh, of perch. And this is the, the, and actually our research institute supported this application and said, yes, it's, it's likely that the cormorant colonies just there would, would cause serious damage. And uh, there are also terms uh, attached to this, this permission. Oiling had to end 20th of May. That's a, a mistake there. 20th of May it had to end. And uh, this year, for cormorants in Finland anyway, they, they roosted pretty late. So we only got two oiling events in 10th of May and 17th of May. But we did not have permission to follow up the the production of young, because we're not allowed to go there after 20th of May, and that's to do with protection of other bird species that are nesting. But in, on this area, there are no other bird species nesting. Yes? Can I ask a question? Yeah, I think so. Those, those, those white dresses they have on there, what, what, what are Ah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just curious about why they're wearing these white dresses out there. <laughs> these overalls, uh, we, we just had them to, in case we got dirty or stinking. Well, that's, a, <laughs> that's a very good idea. We should try to do that. I mean, every time I've been out in the colonies to, to track birds, I've been over puked everywhere because uh -huh. these, yeah, they, yeah, they throw uh, up on you. Yes. So they got like rotten fish yeah, everywhere. Yeah, okay. no, they all left, the, the adults all left while we were there. Yeah. But uh, but we had we just uh, we had these overalls so okay. not in case. So it's not because you're afraid of. No or, no no it was just a okay. uh, safety measure. <laughs> but uh, the second time I, I joined in on the, or helped helped uh, in this, uh, and the second time we went we saw a big difference there with the birds staying much longer on the nest already. Like we had to go on land before they flew up and then they came back much quicker, so they got used to it. And uh, what I, I would say about egg oiling is that, and I think Thomas has also said that, that it has an immediate effect by reducing the, the requirement of food for the for young. So it does have an effect like that. Okay, then uh, when talking about uh, management measures, I, I need to also bring in the Oland example here. Oland Island is a part of, it's an anonymous part, uh, autonomous part of Finland. And uh, here they had a colony in 2008, I think. They had a colony of uh, 50 nests or something. And uh, 2009, they started hunting, hunting cormorants there. They make an annual management plan stating that, that if they will monitor the situation for cormorant, the species cormorant sinensis, in the Baltic Sea, and if something happens to the status of it, they will stop the hunting. But um, and they and then everyone has to apply for a personal license, and the prerequisite is that you have a hunting license in a in a certain area, and then you get a also a license to shoot cormorants. And each year there is about 800 to 1,000 shot each year, 
in the in the now I can't remember the the time in the seas. I mean, it's the, it starts uh, in August, no. and there are no colonies. And also in, on Orland Island, one of the terms for this um, license is that you have to take the cormorant for use. So the the local the chef there. Uh, one of the chefs that have restaurants in, in, a, in many places there have actually um, specialized in dishes on cormorant. So he makes, a, uh, for example, a, a pizza with cormorant topping on and, um, and also other recipes. But it's good that you use the, you use the birds that you shoot and it's, it's part of the hunting culture. Okay, now I'm going to go into research that has been done, been done since those diet studies in 2002 to 2008. There were, has been more studies done 2010 forward. And these are the mo most important studies that have been done and they are obviously the managing authorities use these when they look at the applications. So they have great importance in Finland. So, so this one has been used for, for a long time, 2011, and it's Lehikoinen, Heikinheimo, and Lappalainen. And they looked at the development of uh, num total numbers of perch and roach from standardized gill net monitoring from 2005 to 2010. They didn't look at the catch per unit effort according to size classes. And then they also you did uh, diet studies, they collected the uh, pellets to look at the proportion of, of roach and perch in the diet. And this, this is the area where it was done. So you have that, that is the station for the gillnet monitoring in Finland. And then you have, uh, that's number 62 is the ISIS square, the 50 times 50. And that colony 15 kilometers away, which 200 pairs. And so they looked at the total numbers, not looking at the size classes, but they, did, they, didn't, uh, they didn't see any effect in the gillnet catches. So the conclusion was that, it, uh, that cormorant's predation does have no effect on fish, on perch and roach uh, populations. Then uh, 2010 to 2012, there was, this is probably the most extensive study in Finland, and it was on the diet, diet of, uh, of uh, cormorants in the archipelago sea and the Botnian sea, uh, where Juhani Salmi and Heikki Auvinen, they, they collected pellets, uh, regurgitated fish and stomach contents, and looked at the, at the content. This is the number of, of samples from each, each type of uh, of um, sample, and uh, they found that only a few species constituted the main diet, but the proportions varied across a season and year. And they found that perch was the most important throughout the whole, the whole uh, during all years and in all areas. And this is an example from one from one year, 2012, from three different colonies, and it just shows you that the perch is the is the most um, is the most uh, common species in the diet. <coughs> Eel powder in this area is, is also, and they also looked at at the uh, roosting season. Uh, in one area, perch could be up to ninety percent of the diet. And they also looked at the length classes and compared it to, to fishing of juveniles with the, with the what's it called now, nut, dragning. Uh, Say nets. nets. And, uh, and cormorant is the red, red uh, bars are the cormorant, which size of the perch the cormorant feed on and then what, what the fishermen take. So it does overlap with the, with the fishermen's uh, catch. Then they also published part of this in, uh, in fisheries research articles uh, published in 2015 and uh, they compared it to the fisheries catches. So they calculated the cormorant's catch 2010 based on these uh, 
on the proportion of perch and pike perch in the samples. And then they looked at what the fisheries, the recreational and commercial fishermen, what they have been f catching there in the archipelago sea from 98 to 2010, so during a long period. And it's, been, it's varied between 500 to 2,000 tonne for perch and 225 and to 525 for pike perch. And if they, they then compared it to what the cormorants take, and the conclusion was that they have a significant effect on catches. Uh, so this group, Johannes Salmi and Heike Auvinen, they are in, at the Natural Nature Institute for Research in Turku. And then you have another group, the Heikin Heimo and Lehikoinen and Lehtonen, they are in Helsinki. And uh, they didn't agree with the interpretations of their colleagues in, in Turku, so they wrote a, a letter to the editor to criticize this research and that their point was that they have, uh, they have overreacted or exaggerated the impact of cormorants, that they wouldn't have an effect on the catches. And then obviously, hey, uh, um, Auvinen and Salmi replied to this uh, criticism. But this has an effect on the management as well, because they, they have taken, they more lean towards Haken Heimo's view and that this is why we have more restrictions in the derogation measures that have been permitted. Uh, but that letter was not enough for, for some of these researchers. They also used the same data and did other modeling with it and got uh, totally different results, that there was no effect on catches. So this is the same data as was used in Salmi et al. So it's very complicated when free fisheries researchers are, are in, in disagreement. It makes it more complicated, the whole situation in Finland. Um, then 2017, Lehikoinen, Heiken Heimo and Lehtinen and Rusanen made a, another article and they looked at the development of commercial fisheries catches, the CPUAE, of perch and pike perch during 2005 to 2014 in the ICES uh, uh, squares and they compared it to the, to the occurrence of cormorants. And uh, although perch is one of the most important prey species for cormorants, they concluded that the commercial perch CPUE has increased in 10 of the 29 IC squares in these years, 2005 to 2014. And pike perch has increased in five of 25 squares. And in only in one square had pike perch catches decreased. So they actually, uh, the press release was that that uh, uh, you could interpret the press release as such that the cormorants have caused perch uh, catches to increase. And if you look at it uh, more closely, this, uh, this is uh, Heike Auvinen actually who, who, who pointed these, uh, these points out from the article, is that if you look at these are the squares that they studied and for on this side the the number at the top is the number of the square, and then you have a plus for if the catch has increased, a, a, a zero if it's if stayed the same, and then a minus if it's decreased. And the, the first one is for perch, and the second one is for pike perch. And uh, so if you look at the uh, perch, it said that, was it ten, in 10 squares they have increased. You look at these two squares on Oland Islands where you have, uh, you have no colonies of, of cormorants. Uh, or the colony they have included is the one from 2008 with 58 nests, but, uh, but then after that they didn't have any because they were hunting it. And then you have these other two squares where there were zero to 100 nests in that whole square, which is 50 times 50 kilometers. So uh, if you look at that, six of those 10 squares that they say that it's increased, the, the current numbers are so low, or they have nothing. These are the numbers, okay. Uh, then we have this study of Hanson that Niels already uh, went through here. Um, but I just want to point out that, uh, that this study, who show, which showed that cormorants take more perch than the fisheries take together, that also these researchers criticized that. 
and they say that they've exaggerated the, the effect of, of cormorants. Uh, now we have move on to a new study in Finland that was made this year, 2018, where we are pit tagging, we're using the same methods as, uh, as Niels does. Pit tagging of perch to study cormorant predation. And this is Lari Veneranta in Vasa at the Natural Research Institute. Outside Vasa is doing, has done this study. Um, and he, he pit tagged perch with these uh, 12 millimeter tags, smaller tags. 1,997 perch were tagged, and the perch were caught by fike nets, uh, by commercial fishermen. And then uh, he did this uh, length distribution among the the tagged perch, so they would they would be the similar to what Salmi and Alvinen found in their studies. And then he did the tracking of colonies and they some of these areas are very rocky uh, so they could easily the tags could easily be lost through gaps in the, between the rocks but he has done a blind test in these areas too where he's put out the tag tags to see how, how what is the percentage that he he will track so the results are not ready for this yet, but but he has uh, he has uh, he, uh, in that perspective it's not ready because he hasn't done the blind tests yet, but he has uh, he has gone through these colonies to see how many of the tags he finds, and so in that Merkinta Baika here it's the place of tagging, and uh, and then he's found 33 out here 19 kilometers away and then 92, 17 kilometers away, and 49 and the colony nearest to the tagging area. So 177, 9% of the tags he, he is found. But then it depends on the efficiency of the tracking that will affect the results. And then the current situation. So uh, you remember the, the graph that I showed you when they were doing the management plan, uh, about 3,000 pairs, 2004, and now this year we had 26,700 pairs in 49 colonies. So it has decreased, increased uh, very quickly, the population. And uh, with all the problems with getting derogation measures, the way the terms are in the derogation measures had, has caused a lot of anger among the locals and the fishermen. And in 2017, we had three cases of these uh, cormorants that had been hung up in, in uh, road signs. And in one, one of them, it said, we will take them as well. And these got, got a lot of new... Um, a lot, a lot of space in the news in Finland, also in the national news. And uh, people from BirdLife were interviewed and said, yeah, these people, they hate nature and uh, they just want to kill everything. But that's not, the, that's not how I interpret it. it it's, it's a demonstration of frustration uh, among the locals that it's so difficult to get uh, permission to do anything and they see their catches are decreasing and it's difficult to, to get any fish like before. Uh, so prolonged application process, it's been up to 18 months, the application process. And actually that uh, is another story because uh, the fi some fisheries associations made a, a, an appeal to the ch Chancellor of Justice in Finland who whose job is to monitor authorities to make sure they are, they are doing everything correctly. And the, the decision came from uh, last week and uh, they decided that yes, that this is too long of a process time, it shouldn't take this long. And that they've actually broken the administrative law and the constitutional law by, by taking this long. And they urged them to, to follow the law, but that's, they can't do anything more than that. So hopefully we'll see a change now. And then I have put that picture up because that happened the same day. Uh, so I told you about this chef on Orland Islands who, 
who he has just recently done a cookbook with different recipes on, on wild on wild meat and, uh, for example, seal and cormorants. And he did a promotion of, of this book along our, in our area. And he had one local restaurant involved and he was going to serve this uh, cormorant stew. And they made a lot of advertisement in the new local paper and the radio, like, yes, come and, and taste this uh, cormorant stew. But then the same day, the, the same uh, authorities that took 18 months to do to process these applications, immediately said, no, this is forbidden. You cannot serve these uh, comments <laughs> because the, it's forbidden in Finland. For, it, as it is a protected species, it's forbidden to, to have the comments and it's forbidden to sell and eat. It's forbidden to have the, have the meat. Yeah. So, and then I just want to show you some fisheries catch statistics here and uh, I met uh, a few days ago. I met met some of the coastal fishermen, small scale fishermen that that focus on on perch fisheries, and they say this year has been catastrophic. Last year was bad. They said this year is catastrophic. They they can't get the perch, and perch has become in Finland a very uh, sought after fish species in the recent years. Yes, it's, it is expensive, and it's more, more expensive because they, you, there is less of them. So, And then whitefish and pike perch as well. And then uh, to end here, I'm a bit early, but we have time for questions then. Uh, is that I, I see it, and I'm, I think I'm quite well informed about the, the situation, but it is very complicated because of this research that are pushing different directions. And then we have obviously the managing authorities. Uh, they they lean on these researchers, and we have ornithological organizations, environmental protection organizations, and then we have also politics involved. So we have Green Party. They are against that anything is done to cormorants. Then we have uh, along the coast. I forgot to say that it's very Swedish-speaking areas. In Finland, we have six percent of our of our population is Swedish speaking and they live along the coast. So it's also a language, uh, pr language question. And uh, so we are mostly the Swedish People's Party get their votes from the coastal areas. And they are only 5% on, on the national politics level. So they don't have much strength to, to drive this issue. Uh, and then uh, the most recent thing is that the Minister of Environment has appointed a new working group and the aim is to make a strategy for managing cormorants and to suggest management measures. And the first meeting was, was held here in, in, in Helsinki on Tuesday last week. And it's uh, actually it's too early to say at this moment what it's going to lead to because they are, they are the same in, in national interest groups involved and, and but I can gather is that they haven't much uh, changed uh, position in there, what they think in this, this issue. Okay, thank you for attention and please ask questions. Thank you, Marina, for that long and interesting presentation. If I may you now summarize this, then uh, maybe, maybe I was wrong, but my feeling is that in Finland also, uh, yeah, we have not had discussion about Estonia, but, but in Finland you still are debating on a level of science, I mean, and you, you don't really have absolutely clear, overwhelming uh, reports showing that, that, that cormorants have real devastating effect on fish stocks, maybe maybe the only exclusion of some, some areas or some stocks you mentioned also, sea trout or, or, or you didn't, I remember, but in our discussion you mentioned yeah. that in some areas it might be possible. But actually, uh, but my question is rather, my first question then, uh, my, my question is rather that um, Finland, you, you mentioned uh, both Finland and Holland, still this is the same state at least on the level mm -hmm. of the, how world politics goes on, but isn't this so that the situation, uh, how you would like to manage or how you, how you look to the situation is completely different? You, you mentioned that in Holland, or you showed that in Holland 
there are also some regulations, but basically every, everybody who could read uh, looked that the limitation for shooting cormorants is that you should have legal hunting license, mm -hmm. or which is absolutely normal that you are allowed to use gun. And if you are allowed to use gun, then you can shoot. Mm -hmm. And in Finland, it was very, very different, just 1% allowed or so. What is your opinion? Why it is so different? basically in the same country, the attitude mm. towards the problem. Why it is so different? Mm. Well, all and islands is an autonomy. They have their own government there and yeah. they have their own laws. Yeah, they I, have, I know. But and this, this, uh, this uh, question belongs to the Holland government to mm -hmm. decide on. And yeah. they've taken it into their hunting scheme and uh, mm -hmm. they made it a, into a huntable species almost. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but, but, but yes, that, that, of course. That, that is absolutely correct. But what I mean, that it, in both countries, so to say, people live, they have elected uh, representatives in the government and, and in governments, the, uh, mm. the decision stakes are mm. very different. Yeah, good question. I haven't thought of it before, <laughs> but, but I, I think that it's because they are uh, archipelago people, mm. that are, they are on an island, there are 25,000 people living there, mm. they're uh, in their government, they have um, election, elected people from the whole, their islands and uh, the main island and, and um, they don't have, uh, they don't have any, they haven't made it so that you can appeal these decisions. It's not possible to appeal, mm -hmm. so they haven't got that either, which we have in Finland. They, the decisions on degradation measures can be appealed, mm -hmm. and then so they stop immediately and, and during the, uh, that uh, process time in the courts. So they, they have that difference. And I think that it is that if we in, or, in um, Ostrobotnia would be dis deciding in our area, it would look similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I thank you. I, I also think that uh, politicians take the decisions which actually people like. And, and in, in big countries like in Finland, there are a lot of people who really don't have any contact with mm. the cormorants, yes, exactly. but they have strong opinion, still they have strong opinion about something. And of course, people who are living in town mostly like to protect nature as much as possible without knowing actually yeah. what these yes. species do. And, yes. and as you mentioned, Oland Island, there are a lot of people living in the scar gourds yes, and, and yes. they really have the feeling that what cormorant can... Yeah, exactly, can, yeah. exactly. This is, uh, I think this is the reason. Yeah. 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 Võib Võibolla on küsimusi. Meil ja Volke, Bird Life Estonia. Okay. Yeah. Not any to to anglers and fishermen. Um, myself fishing with mm -hmm. great pleasure. Mm -hmm. I have also comment on this uh, birds directive derogation stuff. You both are EU countries and and let's say. At the moment, you are visiting kind of wild east also in Estonia. Probably you know that that Estonia is the only country in, in EU where really cormorant stands on huntable species list without any limitations and no derogation procedure applied. And let's say nothing except the time frame you have mm. to shoot. Uh, so we, shoot, we are shooting from 500 to 800 birds per year. Mm -hmm. And I had a look at the uh, statistics and let's say from Neil's presentation, most impressive part was the uh, predation on, on salmonids and in rivers and river mouse. And our statistics shows that uh, hunting of cormorants in most important parts of Estonia, where sea trout and salmon goes to spawn. I mean, uh, northern coast of Gulf of Finland. There were counties, as I remember, yeah, three counties basically Harjuma, Idaviruma, and Lääneviruma. The total number of shot cormorants was from two to eight, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, what my point is that uh, for Estonia, I think, would be really, uh, really clever also to put on kind of derogation procedure to, let's say, have direct 
uh, let's say, tool to say hunters that it's really important to hunt this bird in Gulf of Finland mm. to protect salmonids and these rivers which are, can be vulnerable in, in the future, mm. not, not at the moment, but and, and the second good thing is that, that then if we talk about cooperation and then let's say EU-wide mm, uh, kind of yeah, management measures and, and schemes, then Estonia can stand on the floor and not look like Russia was, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, but, okay. but, okay. but let's say first step is to, to say that uh, EU legislation is kind of even and then flat for everyone and then then we can do something mm -hmm. together and then mm -hmm. have serious talks about yes. cooperation. Mm -hmm. If you agree, <coughs> that's good. Well, I think it's a good point there because it's, uh, Oh, you in that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I wasn't really, actually, I wasn't aware that it's okay to hunt uh, cormorants in, in Estonia. I know that, that the fishermen are basically doing it, but I thought it was more like not asking, just doing. But uh, so, so the official statistics that you're talking about, 800 or 200 or something, yeah. yeah. Is that, do you think that's anywhere realistic? Isn't it much, much more or what? I mean, that sounds like very, very few birds to me. They are just not interested. So okay. Yeah. Okay. No, but no, honestly, yeah, sure, it would be nice to, uh, and I don't think it would be a hindrance either for, for you here in Estonia to, to go in and do like, other countries do use the derogation, say, okay, we have these documentations and we have this suspicion and the comrades are here, they do damage, so let's keep on doing it. I think that would be, would probably be better, like you say, to have it up officially instead of doing it. I don't know, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, if you get into problems like, like they have in Finland with some legislators and some people in the government having problems with it, then it might be, uh, be bad enough, I don't know. But I think you guys should go out and do some very, very basic studies in some of your salmon rivers and find out what goes on there before you do anything else. Marina, I, I think I have really one question which many people might have. Uh, this is uh, about the amount of Ill illegal actions mm -hmm. against cormorants. The question is, maybe, maybe the background of the question is that here in Estonia, we are little, still a little bit of, of uh, Soviet people. And Soviet uh, time, it means that actually officially you did one thing and in reality you did something else. So I think in Finland you have had always this Finnish state and you have mm. much bigger respect maybe towards Finnish law and so on. So I, I cannot report it openly, but my feeling is that we have a lot and a lot of illegal actions against cormorants in Estonia. So you mentioned several in Finland, but what is your mm. situation, and in yeah. past, what, what is your situation about uh, today? Are there any, in, in, in bigger amount, mm. any actions, or what, ca can you say something at yeah, least? Yeah, it's a good question. I forgot to, I was thinking to mention mm. that, that uh, as I showed you at the start, there were these illegal actions, and they have continued over time, but they have decreased in numbers. And always when the cormorants have spread to a new area, there has often been some illegal actions. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this year, for example, one colony that had been 2,600 nests last year was, was uh, removed from there. We don't know how they didn't come back to that area. Um, and then there, there has been reports to, that has been reported to police too, of, of destroying of eggs and so on, but no one has ever been prosecuted. But, it, but then in the southern Finland, I, I spoke to a, my colleague in, in southern Finland, and he said that now, because they've, they've had a fight, or they've debated over this since 96, almost, 2000 and so on, when there was, they saw the numbers increasing, and they, they, have fought, they have fought with the authorities, and they are, so, they are just tired of it. So they don't, they don't fight anymore and there is not so many legal actions anymore there are some but it has in decreased in numbers because of it doesn't make sense that that would decrease with frustration but after a long time of, of nothing happening so then 
people are quite, uh, they don't, they, they've lost like mm. hope, hope and so on. But. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is also what in Estonia or, or in Nils also have used to say that this is a power of silence, which means that people really don't complain, they just go and do something and we even don't know because they are talking much about that, but there are some indications. Võibolla veel küsimusi? Nii. Is there any cormorant problem in inland waters in Finland? Yeah, good question too. I was going to mention that too, but I, I missed it. Yeah, uh, they haven't been any successful nesting yet in inland, but there has been attempts for nesting. But though, and that actually, going to, to your, your question again, there has been illegal actions there in inland water in some lakes. So there were maybe three nests in one area that were destroyed last year. But I'm not sure of, of this year, but there has been no, no officially, there is no nests uh, reported in the, in the inland waters. What about observations? Of observations of, uh, of foraging uh, cormorants, yes. In there has been. Also. Yes, in rivers and, and lakes. But there has been no nesting. And, uh, and uh, when I sp speak to to people from the inland, they, they don't take it seriously that there is a threat yet. They say, no, this, is, this problem does not affect us. I, I say, but look at the Danish uh, situation, but so we'll see how that. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. We have one more question here. Huh? <coughs> Torsten Wichmann from Germany. No question, but uh, to added information. Uh, at the one side, I'm a member of a flag in Germany. And uh, on the other side, I'm uh, vice president of our uh, German Angler Alliance, and I'm a member of the board of Euro European Angler Alliance. And at first, the European Angler Alliance tried to change the Cormoran on the NX2, yes, that it will be a handleable co uh, animal, so that uh, we can get easier permission to mm. manage that. Mm. I don't know if we are successful, but we try, we fight for this thing, mm -hmm. then uh, the cormorant is not in danger, yes? But some stocks of fish are absolutely mm -hmm. in danger, mm -hmm. not only in economic danger, also in mm -hmm. ecological danger, yes? And on the other side, uh, flags, yes? Uh, I don't know if you know it, uh, it exists since one year, a uh, transnational cooperation project, seals and cormorants damages, between uh, flags, 14 flags from Sweden, Finland, one from Estonia and one from Germany. I'm from Germany, flag, we are a member of this project. And uh, in the last months we have made interviews with fishermen and we have 220 uh, interviews and now the uh, results were uh, evaluated by the Institute Luke in Finland, yes. mm -hmm. and I think in a, f a quarter or a half year we have the results on the table and we can show how are the damages of cormorants and seals in the Baltic Sea, yes? And then we can, I hope, we can better show the influence, yes? The influence is not zero and it's very high economic influence, yes? And then that must be the basic for other or better management plans or managers in the member states of the Baltic Sea, yes? It can be different, but we must do more, I think. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Marina. I think uh, now it is time already uh, for, for the Estonian presentations, which will, will be held in Estonia. <laughs> so please, Nils and Marina.